Okay, it says we're going live, double checking it. Okay, I'm not sure if we're live or not, let me see. Okay, I think it may not be. Let me double check it over here. Okay, Lindsay, looks like we are live. Hooray. All right, so everybody, welcome to Mighty Mystery Interviews. I am your host, Sarah DeBello, and today I am absolutely thrilled to be with Lindsay Rogers Cook author of How to Bury Your Brother. And we, yes, we have our matching books, ebook and paper book. We're swinging in it, old school and new school style. Lindsay, I'm thrilled to host you. Tell us about your book. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so How to Bury Your Brother is a sibling story at its heart. So it's about a brother and a sister who are very close as children. Um, but the brother runs away from the house when he's 15 and his sister never sees him again. The next she hears of him, he's dead of an opioid overdose and she's at his funeral. So when she's at the funeral, there's so many unanswered questions about where he's been, what he's been doing, um, what it means for the family and what secrets her parents and other members of the family are keeping from her. Um, so later on, she discovers a box of sealed letters in her childhood family home and their letters that her brother wrote shortly before his death. Uh, there's not a letter for her. There is one for her mother. Um, and she decides to deliver the letters to learn more about him. And she uncovers a lot of secrets, um, including why he left and more about how he died in the process. And this is such an important topic and something that so many Americans can relate to. So thank you for bravely um, starting the conversation about this, uh, about the opioid crisis in such a personal, beautiful and heartfelt way. Um, New York Times bestselling author Nathan Hill says this is a deeply wise book about the secrets that families keep and the dysfunction that grumbled just beneath the surface. A profoundly honest and insightful and beautiful novel. That is one but many beautiful reviews. Um, Nathan also says that Lindsay Rogers Cook has blessed us with this penetrating page turning mystery about that greatest mystery of all, family. So I think that's something that even more of us can relate to because so many of us are <laughs> wrestling with questions about our, our family and why uh, members, certain members of the family act in certain ways. So um, this is relatable in so many different ways. So Lindsay, how long did it take you to write this book? I've been writing it since 2014. So um, it took a while. <laughs> I wrote it, I uh, discarded a lot of chapters, I deleted characters, I changed the ending about 15 times. So uh, lots of twists and turns along the way, but I think that is what helps make it twisty and turny for the reader. <laughs> but even <laughs> I didn't know how it ended. Exactly. And as you and I have chatted about, there are two different kinds of writers in this world. There are plotters and there are pantsers. You, my friend, fall into the pantser category. So tell us about what that was like to write this book as a pantser. And so for the audience, um, if you're not sure what that is, there are two kinds of writers. One sits down and rigorously, carefully plots out, you know, every single thing that's going to happen, then writes it. Then there's the wild and crazy uh, characters like Lindsay and I who just see where the story takes us. So Lindsay, what was that like? Is that why you had to write the ending 15 times or did you know, tell us about that? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm sure that it would have been a yes. lot more fun if I could be, thank you. <laughs> if I could be a plotter, it all seems very like, civilized and adult and mature, but uh, unfortunately, no. Part of my strategy for finishing the book, uh, there was like a four month period where I decided that I could only drink wine or coffee if I was sitting at my desk. That's what I had to do to motivate myself to like push through the uncertainty. Um, but it also makes it a lot more exciting, I think, because I don't know what's going to happen. So I could definitely travel along with Alice and kind of learn more about Rob and learn more about her as she is doing the same thing. So it definitely kind of felt like uh, Alice and I were together in like a canoe along the Georgia River uh, trying to figure out uh, all these mysteries. 
I absolutely love that. And I have so many questions. So first of all, um, I'm intrigued wine, wine or coffee being the only two beverages, um, that you allowed yourself to drink at, at your desk. So which, um, were you drinking when you wrote these 15 different possible endings <laughs> and how did that probably help you definitely help or the hinder? wine or maybe as it got to more endings, like a martini, <laughs> but, um, yeah, the end, the ending, the ending was a struggle for me. So I always knew what the final letter would be. That was kind of um, something I knew from the very beginning, what that final letter would be. But I mm. struggled a lot with uh, what would happen after. Um, and I think where, when you have a book that the stakes are so high, um, on the one hand, you kind of want to like reward the heroes and kind of like punish the villains. But um, when you get into a family with so many secrets in a Southern family, I think there's really never like a hero and a villain. Everyone has, you know, lightness and darkness in, in inside both of us. So that makes it difficult when you're trying to be like punitive <laughs> as the writer. So I went back and forth very many times with um, what the future of Alice's life uh, would look like. And I think ultimately it's uh, mostly up to the reader, but I give you some hints of what I think. <laughs> Well, that is very mysterious and I can't wait to read it. Um, so speaking of family, I understand you have a brother. How, how did he react when he saw the title of this book? <laughs> he is fine with it. So from the very beginning, uh, when he saw the title, he actually didn't even know what the title was. And then someone came up to him and said, what did you do to your sister? <laughs> and he was like, what? and he figured out that we changed the title to How to Bear Your Brother. <laughs> so he's very much still alive and well. Um, title has nothing to do with him, uh, and he's been a very good sport about it, especially with how many people have been asking him if he cares about the title. <laughs> <laughs> May I suggest that you send him a shovel for Christmas? Just leave it unsaid. <laughs> that would be the beginning of uh, the second mystery. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, you, you segue from letters to boxes and he gets the first one and it's just a shovel and it's not, it's unsigned, but he knows who it's from because he's read the book. Right. That, I mean, that would be very frightening. I don't, I wouldn't want to get a shovel like that. <laughs> no, but I do love the book uh, title because it's so intriguing, right? Like I need to know more. So did, is this your first, is this, did it arrive as a lightning bolt of brilliance? Did you have to try on you know, a hundred other things. Tell us about how you found this, this very interesting title. So I would say it did arrive as, as a lightning bolt of brilliance, but not my lightning bolt of brilliance, my editor's <laughs> lightning bolt of brilliance. So I struggled with the title. I am not good at coming up with titles. I gave the book so many titles over the years that I was working on it. Um, I want to say some good, some bad, but they were all kind of just bad. Uh, especially in oh. comparison to this. So I was actually about getting ready to go on a trip and I just got an email from the editor who was saying like, here's the new title. And I was like, how to bear your brother. Oh gosh. But oh, then yeah. so I, that's how it happened. You, your editor came up with it and just said it to you. And you I were mean, I'm sure I probably could have like fought if I wanted to, but um, it was after like months of negotiation about like what the title should be and months of brainstorming. And I loved it immediately. I mean, I think that it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it definitely, it's very curious. It's like, oh. <laughs> it is, it is curious. And I think it ended up exactly, I mean, I, I absolutely loved it. Tell us about your path to publication. Were you hacking your way through a jungle? Were you speeding along on a super highway? What did it feel like? How long <laughs> did it take? Tell us all, all the things. Um, I would say maybe like a super highway where you're going really fast, but then you're going in a circle. <laughs> you don't know. More of a NASCAR. <laughs> yeah, like a NASCAR circle. <laughs> um, so when I was writing, I didn't do any research on the publishing industry. I knew nothing about it, um, which I actually would probably recommend to other people because I think you can go down such a rabbit hole because there's just so much to learn. Um, but what that meant is that when I was finally ready to start looking for an agent that I had no idea, like I didn't know, you know, the names of the top publishers or the top agencies or anything about querying or, um, really anything about how the, the publishing process works. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it was a rough go at the, at the beginning. I actually had, uh, one agent and then we ended up parting ways and I got my second agent who I love dearly. 
Um, and she's the one who sold, ended up bringing the book to market uh, and selling the book. So I, uh, I think that it ended up, it ended up perfect, but it was painful getting there. Exactly. I, I, and I think that sort of encompasses the entire thing, right? It ended up where it needed to be, but it was painful <laughs> for so yeah. for so many of us can relate to that. Um, not just about, you know, for the writers in the audience, and certainly we can all relate to that. Um, but for all of us who are just on the journey of our lives, trying to get to that next chapter, be it metaphorical or literal, the next stage of our journey. And, and I think you said it so beautifully. Um, I think so too, for the writers that it's very difficult if your book doesn't fit into one genre necessarily. So I've had a lot of trouble like deciding um, for me and with agents and querying and editors like what to actually call this <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's like kind of a family drama kind of southern fiction but at the same time it doesn't have some of the usual tropes that southern fiction has it has mystery elements but it's not really a thriller um it's literary fiction sort of but also kind of fast so um yeah I think that for anyone who's writing and outside of one clear genre, it can be difficult to find where your book fits into the publishing atmosphere. Exactly. And I think one thing that I learned along the way is I was like, oh, it doesn't fit in. Ergo, it is more appealing because it appeals to everybody. <laughs> um, but that is often not the case where people are perplexed about where to shelve it. <laughs> yeah. It's all about the shelf. <laughs> where does it go on the shelf? That's what I mean. <laughs> it's all about the shelf. Um, tell us about some of the, the titles that didn't make it into the final cut. So the original title that I had for several years was The Funeral Parade. Um, mm. I still like it, but apparently people don't like to read about funerals. <laughs> Who would have known? Um, and then I think one of the worst titles I came up with was Scallywags and Scholars, which sounds I love like, it. <laughs> I mean, I'm intrigued, but it's kind of like you maybe are a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> and then words left unsaid was another title but also kind of sounds like a little too women's fictiony I think um this is also not the original cover so we also changed covers oh my goodness um, so, so lots, lots of changing yes and and what were some of the other covers like the original cover there, it's on my Instagram if you want to see it in the book's highlight uh follow me on Instagram and it has um, flowers around it. So it's kind of cool because it has like all these pink flowers because the book has, um, it deals with environmental issues and the main character is a water conservationist. So it matched the theme, but the whole cover was like pink. And um, so it looked very like girly in a way that it's not really like a necessarily like a girly book. Um, so they changed it again with an email, but I love the second cover. So. And Lindsay, you're just hitting so many topical, important issues today. The environmental crisis, the water crisis, the opioid crisis in a way that doesn't feel preachy or doesn't feel, you know, too heavy, but yet is making this so relevant and so, you know, important for all of us to read. So um, was, was that your thought? Were you like, I want to write about the environmental <laughs> crisis and I shall disguise it as a Southern or, or did it just happen to be that way? Um, it just happened to be the way. I mean, I think it is really, it's difficult when you decide that you're going to do like an issues book. Um, I think I've heard a lot of writers say that if you want to write like a book about mass incarceration or the opioid crisis or whatever. Um, I mean, I am a journalist, so I do reporting and editing for the New York Times. So I think that if I did want to kind of dive into a specific topic, usually I dive in more on my journalistic side. Um, and more on the nonfiction side. So I've done a lot of articles over the years about um, environmental issues and the opioid crisis, um, health disparities, um, reporting a lot on the coronavirus right now. But in terms of the environmental aspect, um, I wanted to give Alice something that was wholly her own just because she deals with so much difficulty in the book with her family. Mm. So I wanted to kind of have her have like a safe space. And I think that um, for her, that's the outdoors and it, it's kind of uniquely her, something that she shares with Rob in childhood and then takes through her adulthood. Um, and then I got the idea of the job from one of my best friends who this is actually her job. So I just stole it from her. And I think it works because um, even though I was writing Southern fiction, I wanted the main character Alice to have like 
to not be a homemaker, to have like basically like a real job with like a real passion. Like she has a master's degree. Um, and that was important to me to just kind of go against some of the existing tropes in Southern fiction. Yeah, I think that is really important. Um, and again, something that I really admire both in your intention and your execution on this book. Um, so again, I'm so excited to read it. Um, Lindsay, what's some of the worst writing advice you've ever gotten? I think probably the worst advice I've ever gotten is that you have to write every day to be a writer. Just because I think that that um, really is a disadvantage for women and people of color who have so many other things that they're dealing with. And I think that if that advice wasn't so prevalent that we would probably have more of those books because I would put this book aside for months at a time to deal with work or family stuff. I mean, most people can't just take two years of their life unpaid and work on a book. If you can, that's awesome, but um, most people can't. So I would say if you wanna be a writer, don't worry if you don't write every day or every week or every month or during the entire coronavirus pandemic, you'll be okay. Yeah, thank you so much for raising that as a point because I do think that historically, especially writing has definitely um, had a very large element of privilege to it. Um, I mean, all the way back to, you know, Virginia Woolf and um, A Room of One's Own, right? You have, to, and yeah. what was it? She said $80 a month or something. So <laughs> not everyone had A Room of One's Own and not everyone had $80 a month and not everyone has the equivalent of those two things today. Um, yeah. And yet everyone has the stories to tell and some of us are called to tell them. And so I do think that that's so important. Um, because the more that we make it seem inaccessible and we have all of these rules and these regulations and these shoulds around it, the less it seems accessible to people who don't have access to that, to the privileged room. <laughs> so um, yeah. I think, thank you for sharing that, you know, you don't, you didn't write for months at a time because for various reasons, including your other career as a journalist <laughs> and, you know, dealing, as you said, with family things and all of those real world things that all of us have to deal with. Um, I know I have not been able to write during the pandemic at all. It's like my attention span has shrunk very to the size of a flea and um, the creativity. I'm here to tell you it's okay. There. You'll be okay. Okay, good. Thank Everything's you. Everything's going to be that. fine. <laughs> all right. So everyone, you heard it straight from Lindsay. It's going to be fine. You don't have to write it every day and especially during a pandemic or at all. Be kind to yourself. <laughs> be kind to yourself. Exactly. Lindsay, what's your favorite scene from this book? For me, it's definitely the first letter that Alice uh, delivers because that was the point where I kind of wasn't completely committed to finishing the book. I started the book and I kind of wasn't really thinking about it as a book. I was kind of like, oh, I'll just, you know, mess around and um, do some writing here and there on this weird project. Um, and Alice kind of isn't committed to her journey then either. She hasn't delivered all of the letters. She's just kind of decided, all right, kind of to spite my husband almost, I'm going to deliver this first letter. And um, the secrets that she uncovers from that first letter hook her in to the rest of the journey. And they also hooked me in and made me want to finish writing it. So uh, I always have a soft spot in my heart for that, for that scene. Oh, I, that's fabulous. I love it. Um, Lindsay, looks like we're getting some questions from uh, our watchers. People want to know, are you working on something else on your next book, your next project? I am. Um, so my deadline for my next book is July 1st. <laughs> so it's coming up. Uh, please don't repeat that. I don't want to know. <laughs> I want to kind of live in a calendarless world where time is slippery and deadlines don't exist. Um, unfortunately, no. So I'm working on that book. Um, it comes out next summer. So summer 2021. Um, it's set in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm. And it's about, um, the pitch is that a rootless linguist um, is told that for every day she stays in her hometown of Memphis, Tennessee, she'll get one of her mother's writings from a time that she doesn't know about where her mother went out of the country with an old flame. Ooh, 
I am intrigued. <laughs> I need to know. Uh, I need to know more. I need to know more about this mother. I need to know more about her <laughs> travels with this old flame. Um, so again, I'm seeing some similarities, family secrets, Southern setting, um, but I'm seeing some very intriguing differences as well in terms of, um, you know, this whole other character, this whole, her other story. Um, but again, that sense of family secrets and unraveling um, to learn more about those people that we may not know so well. What made you want to write that book? I mean, I think it was the same as this book where I kind of had that first gem of an idea. Um, and then I kind of started adding layers to it that I was also interested in exploring. So, I mean, I can't give away too much, but very similar to how to bury your brother, it will push against some existing tropes in the Southern fiction genre. Um, it will explore Memphis um, in a way that I think will be more of like a cityscape versus um, the environmental side of the South that you get in this book. Um, and the main character is a lot younger and, um, you know, doesn't have children when this book starts. So I think that that uh, is also an interesting, it's been interesting for me to write her perspective because she's a little bit more fiery than Alice. Ooh, I like a fire. I like a fiery female. <laughs> I'm in. Um, so Lindsay, back to how, how to bury your brother. Do you see this um, on as a Netflix series? Do you see it as a big a screen, a, you know, on the big screen? Tell us, tell us your writerly dream. Uh, well, if anyone knows Reese Witherspoon, I would love for her to buy this for her. I'm flexible. I can be on Netflix, Hulu, HBO, uh, movie. It's totally up to Reese, whatever she wants. Um, and I would love for Reese to play a character. <laughs> and also, um, I've always imagined Amy Adams as Alice. I don't know why. It's just something about her as Alice to me. I can see it. I can see it. And Reese makes so much sense. She's a Southern girl. Like you're a Southern girl. She loves Southern stories and complicated female characters. Um, so this sounds like a good match to me. Just my two cents. Um, I mean, if you know anyone... <laughs> Reese, call me. <laughs> exactly. Reese, call Lindsay. Um, so Lindsay, wrapping up, is there anything you wish I'd asked? Um, is there anything that you want to tell us about your book, your writing process, writing advice, anything you like to share? Maybe I'll leave where if you can, if you're financially secure enough to do so, please support your local independent bookstore in these crazy times. Um, I know that uh, a lot of booksellers are a lot of us are struggling and booksellers are too. And you've got a lot of time maybe if you're not an essential worker to read some books. So please support your local indie. Yes. And we are linking to the comments, linking in the comments to our partnership with bookshop.org, which um, supports indies. Um, do you have a, a favorite indie that you love? Maybe in Georgia, maybe in New York or one in each? What are your favorite uh, indies? Yeah, maybe I'll give one in each. So Foxtail um, in Woodstock, Georgia did my launch event and they are my favorite bookshop, bookshop in Georgia. And then my home bookshop is uh, Little City Books in Hoboken, New Jersey. And then if you're uh, around the Birmingham, Alabama area, area, Thank You Books in Birmingham just opened before the coronavirus hit. And I'm doing an event with them on June 2nd. So they're also going to have signed copies of my book if you want to support them. Yay, perfect. I'm they sure also they have ship. very cute t-shirts that say Ooh. thank you for reading. So check it out. I feel like I need to have one of those immediately. <laughs> I think we all do. So that will be great. We, um, we love indies. We have a very special... Um, Authors Love Indie series here on Wednesdays where we pair authors with their favorite indies um, and, the, and, they, and they talk and they talk about the love of books. Um, so we love indies, we love authors and we are very happy to support both of, of, um, both of them. So, um, and thank you for supporting indies and for that shout out and for that reminder. Um, Lindsay, it has been so great talking to you and um, cannot wait to read the book and now can't wait to read your next book do you have a title for the next one? Are you still working your way through that? There is a title, but I, I can't share it yet. <laughs> it's a mystery. <laughs> yes. <laughs> one okay, say. perfect. Well, we'll talk to you <laughs> next summer about that one. Um, All right. And until then, please stay safe and stay well. And, um, and thank you again for joining us here on A Mighty Blaze. Thank you so much, Sarah, for everything y'all are doing. Bye. Perfect. <laughs>